uh, Allied Force uh, was the operations uh, on behalf of Kosovars that were being slaughtered by Serbs in 1999, kicked off on March 23. And as I recall, I spent about a month doing nights, and I hate nights, and living on giant roast beef sandwiches. So that's kind of the thread connecting with the previous episode. The important stuff, food and the flying. And I was hopping between crews. And so April was a decent month. Once we got the weather break and NATO started coming up with targets that actually might do something. So I've got an article that will come out someday, probably in Naval Institute Proceedings, because they accepted it, called No Way to Run an Air Campaign. And that is all about 78 days of Allied force, which I liken to casual vandalism on a countrywide scale. Because there wasn't a good air campaign strategy over the long term designed to achieve goals to bring Milosevic to a peace table. It was more like, what can we blow up next that might cause the leadership some pain? That works, but it's kind of the long way around. Uh, and it's really not not recommended. So when we're flying a bunch of missions, I've kind of glossed over the piece, but one of the problems from the earlier operations, deny flight and so on, is that we had never adjusted the rules of engagement fully for what we are actually doing. And the part that they kept was in a no-fly zone, often you will leave certain parts of the rule of engage rules of engagement for other players to execute. I mean, it's easy. If a fighter crosses the no-fly zone, you identify it as a fighter, it's hostile, or it's an enemy fighter, you declare it hostile and you shoot it, that's easy. Where you get into other things is where there's ambiguity. And anytime there was ambiguity, the Air Operations Center wanted a voice in the decision. But this was largely pre-SATCOM. And in a pre-SATCOM environment, the only guys that had it were AWACS and the Air Operations Center. So you had to talk to AWACS. And not all AWACS had SATCOM. And holy cow, this just occurred to me right freaking now. Um, French AWACS may not have had SATCOM. So when you got French AWACS up, you might have been in a position where you could never execute your air-to-air -air rules of engagement if something was outside the normal. The normal being presence of enemy, absence of friendly fighter in the no-fly zone. So the rules of engagement were kind of shaky, and it's all because senior officers wanted to keep their thumb on the pulse, because at the end of the day, they just don't trust air crew to do their jobs, despite the fact that we're the best positioned to do their jobs. And guys proved in the no-fly zones over and over again, we were capable of executing without having to do mother may I. So one of the things I was also doing like any other Strike Eagle guys, it's a multi-role aircraft. And we occasionally did combat air patrol. So I did a night combat air patrol uh, where I was off in the Adriatic Sea waiting for thousands of MiG-21s to take off from Montenegro and make a run on Italy to, um, I don't know what, bomb a pasta factory or something like that. And that, that I have previously mentioned the use of go pills. That's my half a go pill story is six hours flying in ovals, occasionally going to the tanker, looking at a radar screen that's pretty much blank, listening to uh, AWACS garbage up the radio and getting nothing. No hordes, no ship coming out, nothing I could possibly get a hang on because we'd carry six air to air missiles and two GBU 12s because you never know. You might need a, a 500 pound laser guided bomb for something. After all, let's face it, the Strike Eagle's first air-to-air -air kill was obtained by a laser-guided bomb. So having two by two by two and two, plus the gun, you cover all the contingencies. One day, no shit, there I was. And I was flying with Shooter, Shooter Wyatt, and we were on the wing, and we were doing what we called the FIROM cap. And the FIROM cap stands for former... Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia, because the Greeks didn't want Macedonia to call themselves Macedonia, because there's a Greek province named Macedonia, and who knows, people might get confused, and if you had the same name, you might make claims against Greece. That kind of bullshit went on for years. So we solved the whole problem by just saying the FIROM, former Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia. And they were neutral in this. 
And uh, but we were allowed to fly over the airspace. Either we were allowed to fly over the airspace or we were flying it over anyway. I mean, one of those two. And we're in a combat air patrol protecting the tankers because that's where the tanker refuelment tr refueling tracks are. And we're somewhere late. And our call sign is Sword 5-2. We're on the wing. And the other aircraft and the other crew is a blue crew, 492nd Fighter Squadron, new young captain flight lead uh, with actually Red Wizzo. And we're waiting for something to happen. And something happens. I get an air contact. And I'm the only radar that can see it. So despite the fact that we're in formation, we're flying a two-ship combat air patrol oval, my radar is the only one that can see it. I just had a better tuned radar that day. And our AWACS is French. And French AWACS in 1999 sucked. Call sign Cyrano. Not because they weren't a bunch of technically proficient dudes. It's because airborne warning and control was not their job. Their job was airborne early warning. And there's a difference. Uh, the only guys worse than the French AWACS were the NATO AWACS, who are definitely airborne early warning. They're not airborne warning and control. And we tried to use them like it, and they weren't prepared for it. They didn't have any experience doing it, and they're playing a pickup game. So I call out the bullseye, and I start running the chain. You know, contact, bullseye, 350, 42 miles, hits 25, outlaw, spades. Outlaw meaning that I've detected it in enemy airspace. Spades meaning there's no friendly identification friend or foe. And we're actually, the, the cap frequency is on the tanker frequency. And so we're the only game in town. And so people start to listen to the radio frequency. And now they're just calling picture clear. And we make another northbound leg and I pick up the contact again and I get a couple spots on the the targeting pod and it looks like somebody's flying a ground attack profile. It's like somebody's bobbing and weaving down, but they I lock in and they're not fast. It's not at fighter air speeds. So it's not tripping the fighter air speed rules of engagement to say we can go get them. And I make the call again, outlaw spades slow. And Cyrano comes back shortly after with picture clear. Now I make the radio call of my career, which is Cyrano sword five, two. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you the picture is not clear group bullseye three, four, eight, 25 outlaw slow spades. And suddenly a wax goes berserk. I mean, they start, they it's like they're on the radio and they have no idea what I've just actually said. But now the radio, all the tankers have stopped talking. There were Eagle guys on the frequency and another cap. They said, they, they told me later, said, oh, yeah, Star Baby on the radio. And we wanted, we asked permission to commit, request permission to commit, because under the rules of engagement with that slow, we had to get permission from the chaos. And until just, like I said, six to nine minutes ago, it never occurred to me that Cyrano might not have had SATCOM. They might have had no way to communicate with the chaos, but whatever happened, we never heard anything back. We never got permission. These guys completed their mission, which was no doubt strafing refugees, and they went home. And we had a short discussion with the flight lead, and the flight lead and I had a differing interpretation of the rules of engagement. And none of us, neither of us had brought the ROE with us. So we couldn't solve that. And in that case, the flight lead's interpretation is the interpretation for the flight. Right. Regardless of the fact he's a new captain, I'm an old captain, you know, he's a two-ship flight lead, I'm an instructor Wizzo. He's a flight lead. That's what flight discipline looks like. But I that is an example of bad ROE, and I regret that event to this day, because I think it probably cost people their lives on the ground under conditions where we could have and should have been able to intercept and do something about it, except that our own leadership did not trust us. Uh, and I'm not saying at any point that the flight lead made the wrong call, um, you know, with his, his understanding. And even if our understanding had been the same and his interpretation was different on the execution, he's got the hammer. So we did not commit. But that is the kind of thing that was typical of allied force in that we were executing on dumb stuff or leftover stuff. 
So that kind of wraps up my cap stories, my combat air patrol, because I only did two. And, you know, that's the combat air patrol where I wasn't on speed. So um, it was still potentially exciting, but not nearly as exciting as, as I wanted to be. Just just on that, before before you move on. Yeah. Do those things ever change? I ask because if you listen to some of the stories around Syria 2016 or so, you talk, talk to Stinger, you know, he, he was on this channel. He talked a little bit about the necessity to go back to the chaos to get decisions made that needed to be made quickly. And I think one of them, if memory serves, was around some Iranian drone activity threatening US SOF on the ground um, and the frustration of having to wait to get chaos to come back. And actually they said, you know, no kinetic kill. We're using other means to try and deal with it. Um, so I wonder if those things are just universally true throughout time. Uh, you go back to Vietnam, the political interference around target sets, even weaponeering, what you were going to drop and how many and you know what fusing you would use. That, that all came down apparently from political levels. Is that just how it is? That's just kind of how it is. The guys writing the ROE are rarely the guys executing it. I got to write an ROE for uh, Provide Comfort 3. Um, but it was contingency ROE. It was had we stepped into increased hostility. So I wrote the ROE based on what I wanted the ROE to be. Very rarely do you have a line flyer being in a position to do that. So, yeah, it's one of those things where the people that write it are not the people that are executing the missions. And they're trying to control something different. You know, they might be trying to present escalation. Um, but in my experience, it's not thought through as to what the costs are. The cost is always considered of, well, you know, we might get in trouble uh, or something might go wrong. Um, and there's always the classic example, which is the shoot down of the Blackhawks in northern Iraq in 1994. That was not an ROE problem. Um, that was buffoonery by the two ship of light grays that were there and couldn't tell the difference between a black hawk with wing tanks and a hind. Um, but it wasn't an ROE problem. Hmm. And so, but the response is anytime something goes wrong, tighten up the ROE because we can't let the air crew do their jobs because we haven't just spent a couple million dollars and a thousand hours training them up to be good. Um, what, what is the journey then to, uh to that lack of confidence because you know if you sort of assume that at a general officer level there's some influence i'm guessing lawyers are important air force lawyers are important in defining you know how much risk the air force would put itself at if it follows one set of roe versus another i'm sure that's a, a strong influence but but what is the journey that an aviator takes then from being a lieutenant and then a captain and then a major and being maybe going through the weapons school, but certainly being the person who's going to lead a force ship and, and take the fight to the enemy. And then and then they get to the point where now they're a general officer and what would have been the appropriate thing when they were a captain or a major is now not the appropriate thing. Is it, is it ass covering? Is it? I think it's a lot of that, but I also think it's the kind of people you select. So the, the kind of person you selected, let's take Paco, for example. A guy you would absolutely, anytime you were flying in combat, you would want Paco in your Mississippi Sea Eagle. And you'd probably want the gorillas, and you'd probably want him in charge of the squadron. Um, and if he were in charge of writing the ROE, it would be good, solid ROE. It would be executable, and it would be something that he felt that all of his guys could do because he'd trained them to do it. That's not the career path. Paco tops out as a colonel and had no interest in being a general. Um, and you know, that's a different kind of personality. So a lot of the general officer career path is followed by people who can avoid taking risks. And so that's what I think you get on your promotion because, you know, nothing ever goes wrong for these guys. Now there's an element of luck in there and there's, there's drive. And most general officers who I've met have been competent in their area and they have been smart and i am constantly amazed at most general officers their memory for names and faces i mean i remember faces pretty well names i'm not so good with uh and their command of details but all of those are you would find in a good ceo too so i think it mm -hmm. becomes at some point you transition from 
a junior leadership track to a more senior management track. And it, it changes, you change. Now, example on the other side of the house was Dave Deptula, uh, who was the combined force air, yeah, the CFAC, <laughs> combined forces air component commander at Insulik when the, the 494th fighter squadron got RSA three kill in 1998. And he, he had no problem changing the rules of engagement. He changed the rules of engagement based on the prevailing conditions, not on in in Iraq, not on the prevailing winds at Yusefi headquarters. Hmm. That's rare. In my experience, that's rare. And that's extremely rare. Um, so I can't be definitive about it, but I think a conservatism creeps in. And the farther away you get from the squadron, time-wise and distance-wise, the less confidence you have in their ability to do their job. Mm -hmm. um, it's a thing. And uh, yeah, so we ended up with legacy ROE. Um, and that, that cost us on the air-to-air -air front. It cost us probably people on the ground. And I feel that it, it cost the Strike Eagles one and possibly two kills in that particular event. And we weren't, I'm um, certain, the only ones that were put in that cleft. But so I just want to highlight what you got out of this was it was good flight discipline. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was not a fight in the air. It was not a fight on the ground. The flight lead made the call. The flight lead's call is right. Um, and it wasn't like, for example, you're an F-16 and you decide to bomb a bunch of Canadians on a firing range in Afghanistan because your wingman's a senior guy with zero flight discipline. And that's the way it should go. It's both a bad example on the ROE and it's a good, good example, a really good example of you adhere to the ROE and you do it because it's the ROE. I want to ask you about the uh, Canadian incident now. So the Canadian incident was one I wasn't there for. Um, that is the infamous friendly fire incident. Um, two guard F-16 guys where apparently the wingman, who's an experienced, more experienced guy, is just jones in to drop a bomb and hasn't been able to and sees tracer fire on the ground. He rolls in, delivers bombs on the tracer fire and kills a bunch of Canadians on a, practicing on a firing range. Wow. Uh, and that's a that's an unclassified report. You can look it up. It's called Tarnak Farms, T-A-R-N-A-K. And uh, you'll see an egregious breach of flight discipline at multiple points. What happened to him then? Um, they tried to court-martial him and failed because he paid for civilian defense lawyers and basically got off. And I'm sure he's flying for an airline somewhere. Mm. Um, but it it was definitely heinous. Uh, you know, it's, it was horrible stuff. Um, which reinforces my point is, mm. you know, follow the ROE. So there we are in... Uh, in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, where things aren't great and it could have gone better. But I'm still flying fighters and I'm dropping bombs and I'm having the time of my life. You know, one of my best friends is the ops officer for the ops support squadron. I'm eating Italian food. I'm staying in a four star restaurant. I have my own rental car. I'm getting $73 a day per diem. And I have a bicycle and I'm in the Alps, you know, every second or third day, 30 to 50 K, climbing from 110 to 3,800 feet on most days. So if you're going to fight a war, the place to fight it from is clearly Italy. As long as you're not an infantryman slogging up, you know, against German forces in 1943 or 44. But, you know, for fighter guys in the four star hotel with our rental Volkswagen convertible, it, it's a rocking good time. So what I think I'm going to do, because I've talked about a couple of the missions, is I'm going to flash up some some combat video. Like All right, it. so we'll flash up some combat video and we can actually see what I'm talking about. And uh, um, I'll stop it so we don't have a sound overlap thing. And I'll, I'll tell you that the combat video starts out with really, really crappy video. Um, that's because we had three quarter inch Betamax tapes. We used them over and over and over again. And eventually you just knock enough little magnetic particles off the tape and it doesn't record well. So I've got several of these that are just terrible. It's not the digitization, digitization pro process. That's what the tape looks like when you bring it home. And these things aren't last, don't last. If you don't copy your tape immediately, then it's gonna be reused on the next sortie. And if, uh, so we copied it to VHS, we had it uh, all set up and I didn't start doing this till sometime into the fight. 
So I had to go back and try and recover a little bit. There are missions I didn't get because the tape didn't run or that were so bad. I mean, the tape got torn up. It was just, I don't have everything, but I do have some stuff uh, all in unclassified format. So we'll start um, with me and Shooter Wyatt uh, flying on the wing and going to close a tunnel that goes from Serbia to Kosovo because it was being used to ship Serbian police, the MUP. Um, and we had bombed it a couple nights before but we were going for the camp outside and we were dropping bombs through the weather. So share screen quick time. Do you see green? I do. Here we are. You'll notice my production quality is improving. As time goes on. That's a radar map on the right, HUD on the left. As you can see, it's crap. It'll get better as the tape rolls. That is us getting spiked. And you're about to hear a good example of calm from Shooter. Map two, spiked on 120 far. Your radar? Systems updated? Copy, that's a good map. Now we've switched heads up display on the right. Uh, the left side is a tarting pod. It's a little washed out, but it'll begin to clear up. So remember, white is hot. Uh, most of the time when we fly, I tended to fly white hot. And I'm looking for a railroad tunnel that the flight lead, Panther 1, is going to bomb. And we're just the goalie. So we're going to follow along. And if he calls goalie, we will throw our laser on with his designator code and we'll guide his weapons. He doesn't need a goalie. And, and this is at night? This is at night. Okay. Yeah, that would, if because uh, if it were daytime, we actually, the Strike Eagle at the time could not film the forward-looking infrared on the HUD. Oh. If you had it selected, and I definitely had it selected, it just went blank, um, the channel through the system, it could accept the low-quality HUD camera, um, but it, it would just dump all of the flare and you just get HUD symbology. Because I fly with the flare up over the HUD camera 100% of the time because I don't get sun glow. It's a nice crisp picture. Uh, it gives me good SN. What do we... Got those guys out there at the fire on the cap. See, I'd pass the radar up front. Shooter's mirroring the radar. He says, we've got the guys out on the fire arm cap. Okay, we're over Kosovo and, uh, you know, we're going, oh man, well, thankfully today we have bombs and we're not the guys out in the fire arm cap because they're having a boring evening. Fire arm exercise. Looks like we're going a little lower. Let's do our magic state posit. Oh, 134, 102. Copy. Yeah, I got a glow on the ground of Priscata. Yeah. So the picture is beginning to clear up, but it's still extra crappy. Um, and this is all tape. On the right on the HUD, you see the vertical line. That's the azimuth steering line. Uh, it means the pilot is in the air to ground master mode. It means I have designated the target on the radar. And again, we're designating the flight leads target. We are two to four miles behind him, uh, keeping that uh, Panther 2-1 in, in the heads up display. Looking clear, sir, baby. That's what I think. Magic aircraft full zero six seven eighty one. Take call sign. Peace, Mark. Good right. From Spirit four one bull zero six eight seventy eight. Spirit four one zero seven nine three sixty five. Spirit four one three zero eight seven sixty five. Captured. I have 
Captured means I've got the target, so it's tough to see, but you'll see it as it comes up. Um, it is a railroad tunnel going in. And uh, you'll see on the infrared on, on the left side of the scope at the moment, there would be a flashing L if I were firing a laser. So there was a flashing L a second ago, or there will be again, because I'm going to designate the target. But again, I'm just backing up uh, the flight lead. You will also notice mostly how quiet this is. I, as amazing and completely incredible as this would seem, I'm a very quiet Wizzo in the airplane. I've been told by many a pilot that I'm the quietest backseater they have ever flown with, which, of course, is completely incompatible with, you know, my YouTube presence. But that's the way it is. It's all business all the time. And that's all you're hearing is informational call outs. Nine one three zero seven three eighty. Magic picture clear. ID. Copy. Target ID. That's all I say. ID. I got it. I positively ID the target. Doesn't look for time of flight. It's going to look good. Copy that. What Shooter's asking is, we're, we've got wispy clouds around. How does it look for the time of flight? Meaning, are there going to be any clouds in our way? So I back out the pod, look in wide field of view, don't see any, move forward. He's already said it's going to be pretty good. And uh, the backseater in the front aircraft is just called Pickle, meaning he's just released his bomb. Man, this video is terrible. But you can see the railroad tracks coming up from the bottom. And Checking the, radar back. the warm tunnel. And up to the left of the crosshairs, there's a couple craters from previous days where we dropped weapons stupid through the weather because we had no other option. And the backseater is lazing a little higher than where I placed my crosshairs. And two bombs are going to come from the top. Here they come. Shack, shack, straight through. Cover that. We're jamming something. <laughs> so we're off. That's the first hit. And um, we're going to turn around and we're going to get the other end of the tunnel. And so what we don't realize is his bombs went through the top, but it completely collapsed the tunnel. And so we're going to swing around from the other direction. And I'm going to cheat because we're overflying the tunnel on the way out in order to get spacing. So I'm going to designate the tunnel and update my nav system on the first overflight. And then we're going to fly out a bit and turn around. And I'm showing this fast forward because otherwise it's long, boring, and quiet. Uh, tell, tell me about the um, the principle of not reattacking a target then. I mean, you mentioned um, in part two that you struck a target, I think you had some duds, and then you went on to another target. Presumably they, they were far enough apart that you weren't at increased risk of being hit from people or, or defenses that were already alerted. Um, so in this instance, is the other end of the tunnel far enough away that you can do that without them knowing you're coming? In this place, there's no significant threat known or suspected. We're out in the boonies. And even so, I would not have made a third pass because of the possibility of a um, mobile SAM threat. But two passes is my limit. All right, so let's slow this down to normal speed. Well, I got a loose concession heading from Panther. Three, zero, zero. So our flight lead is kind of now swung around behind us, but isn't quite clear what we're doing. Does not have a radar track, so he asked for our heading. And we're going to follow the railroad track in, and now it's time for us to drop our bombs. Okay, captured. Copy, captured. Fire five blast. Laser designation. Target ID. Copy. Panther two target direct two three zero. So Star Baby, have you found this cave entrance, this tunnel entrance? Uh, because it's a target point and your INS is tight and you've because you've just updated it uh, or have you patch mapped using one of your other displays how, how have you found this this entrance 
Uh, so I patch mapped the the first aim point, which I used to tighten up my system. Then on when I overflew this aim point, which I also obviously know the coordinates of, I bounced the laser off it and also updated my system. So I'm dealing with an update to my INS that's, that is um, very recent. And furthermore, there's this big old railroad track leading into the side of a hill. Uh, so it's one of those easier aim points. Uh, I mean, I'm going through the procedures, captured ID, because that's what I always do. Um, but really, Shooter probably ID'd it by the moonlight, um, because it's that obvious an aim point. Lasers off. Yeah. Bombs away, and I turn the laser off. And I'm a delayed laser kind of guy. I don't want the bomb to come off the airplane, see the laser, and start depleting its energy uh, with its guidance system. And so I've got two things set up. Um, the first is I'm going to plan on putting the laser on at about 11 seconds. But I have a backup program so that if my laser fire button fails the auto lays will take over at about nine seconds. And I do this because I accidentally won the 494th's first Strike Eagle Top Gun competition, me and three other Wizzos, um, because I didn't actually drop on a target because I had a laser fire button. And so since they were only counting misses and not no drops, all my you know hits looked pretty good, simulated hits. But I learned that you know, I hadn't completed a drop because the laser fire button had broken. So I had the a lays backup because I never wanted to do that again. Mm -hmm. That's what you get when you fly 300 hours a year. Good spot. Four magic status. Okay, leader. Uh... So the laser is firing. We've got less than 10 seconds to go. I'm lasing over the top of the tunnel. And the bombs, you'll see them come in from the left side. They're actually going to be off a little bit together. But they're going to slam into the side of the tunnel rather than the roof of it. And they're going to collapse it anyway. There they go. Okay, it looks like an effective little rent we could have the case by. And there we go. So night sortie, easy target, you know, uh good situational awareness and no real threat. Here, and I'll jump right to this. I had mentioned in episode two, second night strike in Oberva. This is the one where Cowboy Hughes and I had planned it. We'd pulled out all our tricks. I'm in the number three aircraft, Cowboys in the number one. Uh, we're attacking what we don't know is the second most heavily defended target in Serbia after the capital. Um, we're not going to recognize that until later when we started counting up shots. So according to our Prowler guys, there are 14 SAMs, 13 or 14 SAMs that they believe were shot at the strike package on our ingress and egress. Uh, and through the the effort of the, the seed guys and certainly the jammers, none of those came close enough to worry, although I did see two of them self-destruct at some distance off our left wing. We were on the way out. So we're going to map an airfield. And as I mentioned, my target is a command and control bunker. And on the overhead photos, you actually, the, the tells that there was a bunker there were they planted a hedge around it. And there's a path that suddenly goes through the grass to nowhere. So you'll see the hedge. And as we get closer on the infrared, you're going to see that the bunker rectangular outline is warmer than the surrounding ground. Mm -hmm. And that's going to outline it pretty well. There's going to be a break in this. It won't be a continuous run-in because the any GBU-24 range symbology classifies the HUD as confidential. So that was not transferred to the VHS. That was just no we're on 7 Oh, there it is, mapping, brother. 
It's tough to tell on the right, but underneath my crosshairs, there's this U of the U-shaped hedge around the bunker. Did you hear that? That was calm jamming. Huh. So our interflight frequency was always on half quick, but it was tough to get an entire strike package up on the main frequency on half quick because guys that didn't practice half quick couldn't get up on it. For the audience, half quick is a frequency hopping scheme that is designed to defeat jammers. So this isn't the worst jammer I've ever heard, and it's intermittent. The worst jamming I've ever heard was hearing half of a short telephone conversation in Serbo-Croatian by a woman. You only heard her half of it, and they played it over and over and over again on your frequency. Maddening, but it didn't affect the mission. Uh, also, the greatest hits of the Serbian Tabernacle Choir occasionally came across as jabbing. Medic, <laughs> Empty. That's our seed guy, just called empty. So nothing, no radars on the scope. Okay, sorry, direct, scratch. Okay, there goes your bombs. Cause one is the lead. Okay. Wow, something just cooked off. Yeah, that must have been short. You hear that call? Bombs fell short. No call sign, but voice voice recognition tells us that one of the first two aircraft has uh its bombs dropped shorter than where they expected it to go. Now they got something because Dodger just said there's a secondary explosion. But the bombs aren't where they wanted to go. And the first two aircraft are targeting the elements of the SA-3 battery that should be there at the field, at the end of the field that's out of my field of view to the left. Push our release to the floor of the envelope. That's the only trick I've got. If the bombs fell short, I'm assuming they were released at too long a range. Our date is questionable. Just push it up. We're going to release closer. What, what envelope did you call it? Fernie. What you said push release to the Fernie envelope? What did you say? To the front of the envelope. To the front of the envelope, okay. Yeah, I can only understand that because I know what I'm saying. Well, closer. Call Bob short. There's our break. And at this point, where we rejoin our heroes. The bombs have been released at whatever range we chose to release them, which is less range than we'd planned on releasing them. And the bunker is under the crosshairs. You can see the U-shaped hedge around them. You can see the access road. You can see the taxiway. The runway is almost off the bottom, but you can see a bit of it in the corner. And as we get uh, a better view, you'll see that the, the rectangular bunker looks warm. Seconds. Time of impact up here, 36 seconds to go. Now you can make out that it's a little warmer. That was Cowboy Hughes in the lead aircraft. We are 13 seconds to impact. The bombs will come from the right. And as I mentioned, when you look at it, notice the first one does not detonate. Okay. 
And we're off. So Dave Dodger was Bud Zero One uh, during the Sam kill. And so we're paired again, uh, this time in the same aircraft. Uh, and that is our first drop of Allied Force. It's interesting you, when you uh, analyze it. It kind of reminds me of the uh, dentist showing me x-rays of my teeth and explaining things to me. And I'm thinking it all just looks like black and white to me. Um, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Um, the video just doesn't get much better. Do, do, does, it, does it look a lot better in the in the aeroplane than on the MPD? It looks a lot better on the aeroplane. Okay. So, we had a quick discussion the last time. Another night sortie. This is Easter morning. This is the Kraljevo ammunition plant. And ammunition plants at night are great. It's like throwing a Molotov cocktail into a firework stand. And... I've made one pass around with a GBU-10. The bomb's gone stupid because my laser bouncing off the clouds drew the just threw the pod into East Bejesus, and um, that bomb never detonated anyway. So we've got six Mark 82s. I'm talking the the front seater through it. We're actually separated from the rest of the four ship, uh, and I'm 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 kind of doing a precision approach from the back seat, but I've designated the target. We have a line of sheds that are allegedly containing 155 millimeter artillery rounds, which would make a nice bang when hit. So in this case, no laser guided bombs. These are all stupid. And you can see smoke because this this was kind of misplanned. Uh, we're su you're supposed to go upwind to downwind and you can see we've got smoke drifting across the target area. Uh, it's gonna make it a little bit more miserable and make it a hard thing for laser guided bombs but we're not dropping laser-guided bombs. And you're at 25,000 feet, so you're dropping these Mark 82s from a long way up. What's your circular error probable for something like that sort of drop? Um, I'd like to bullshit you and tell you that I actually know what that is, but I have no freaking idea whatsoever. Okay. Um, which is why I'm dropping them in a long string of six rather than like three pairs of two or something like that, is I'm okay. not confident. I think my left-right error is going to be pretty good. It's the long track error that I'm really worried about. And the F-15E has a wind model. A any of the modern fighters have a wind model whereby it takes the current winds at your altitude and it assumes that they vary in a predictable manner down to the surface. They don't, but it's not bad. And we don't have any wind shear. And as you can see from the smoke, the winds on the surface are kind of light. Mm. So we're in a good wind situation. Um, I wasn't smart enough to think through that, look at the smoke and figure out the winds. I was just designating and dropping. And you can see the, the kind of square shaped open courtyard building is just above my aim point. My aim points the shed slightly below it as the pods look in. So that long tone is a front seater holding down the pickle button the whole time to give all six bombs time to come off uh, and the computer does the release. So all the pickle button really when you're in, you're in automatic delivery like this is it's a consent switch. You're saying, I consent for the computer to release the bombs. So he holds down the pickle button, we release the bombs, and we drop a string. And um, we're naked does not mean that we've taken our flight suits off in flight. It means that there's no radar on our radar warning scope. And from a long way away, it's tough to tell. That's a much bigger bang than a Mark 82 normally generates. So we knew it was on target and we knew that there was something flammable in it. And then we're out of here. We're going to rejoin the rest of the flight and leave. And you can see, you got fast forwarded it there, but you can see where the 
the clouds have been interfering with that particular strike. So that was Easter morning. And uh, during the Easter ceasefire, the Serbs said it was a ceasefire, but they shot at us anyway, which, as I've said before, is totally legit. Uh, and I actually then went, hopped on a train and went to Easter Mass in Venice um, with a friend right uh, right afterwards. And we arrived, we got the times wrong. We went to an Episcopal church and Mass had already happened. So the priest actually did a, a, a low Mass just for or high Mass, a Mass involving some level of altitude. And uh, the uh, in seven minutes flat, it was like the best Easter mass ever and seven minutes flat. We were the only people in the church when historic church in Venice, we take the train ride home after we grabbed a bite. And I actually took my bandana out of my pocket and kind of wrapped my digital watch up against my ear and set an alarm. Cause I, I knew I was going to collapse from exhaustion on the train. And I didn't want to miss the stop for Pordenone and end up in Trieste up along the border with Slovenia. <laughs> So I basically taped my digital Casio watch to my ear so that I wouldn't oversleep. That's one of my, my you know, my big worries about trains is, you know, what happens if you're still on the train? Well, you're going someplace you weren't planning on. <laughs> I just think of it as, you know, getting better use out of your ticket. So I wanted to stop there because one of the complaints I get from Steve is that I never shut up. So here's your opportunity to insert something before I go for some more video. Well, I was uh, sort of curious about the... I don't know if this is part of the the um, video that you're going to show, but you you had talked about your combat check ride, and because you got a yeah, DFC, so is that is that coming? Am I am I jumping the gun by asking about that? Yeah, no, it's good. This is a okay. good point to, to go into it. So because I can talk about check rides. Well, and well, 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 let me ask you another question then. If it was coming anyway, um, let me ask you another question, which actually goes back to part two because I didn't I didn't get a chance to ask it then, but I was curious about it. So you talked about the planning, um, and I apologise to the audience for sort of jumping around a little bit here, but I think it's still relevant to, to what we're dis what you're discussing here. But you talked about going to Vicenza being part of the chaos, doing your one week stint before things kicked off there. Uh, You've also talked about the you know high levels of proficiency that the Mirage two thousand guys had, the French guys had, and, and and conversely, not so much from the German Tornado ECRs. But I was wondering, as a component of the planning process, then how much do you have to know about other Allied aircraft and their capabilities? I understand the concept of a capabilities briefing. You can have a secret level, NATO secret level briefing about a Mirage 2000. How important is that stuff? And and uh, is there a temptation when you're doing that just to shove the other guys at the back and go with what you know? You know the F-15 well. You probably know the F-16 better than you know the, the Mirage 2000 and so on. Yeah, so if you've got that temptation, you've no business being a mission commander and you probably shouldn't be in the mission planning cell. So in NATO, you get a pretty good idea of other guys' capabilities, both in terms of the actual hardware and in terms of the culture, but you don't know it all. So, for example, the Mirage 2000D has a fixed out or had at the time in 1999, their laser designators require them to be X number of feet above the target and only X number of feet above the target. Uh, and so you're going to work them into the planning process. But you need to work everybody in so that they understand what's going on. They agree with their part of the plan. And so you're not trying to fly their airplane for them in an environment where you don't know Jack really about how that guy is going to employ his airplane. Um, the, the nuances, because the planning, you have to include the nuances there. Uh, and there are certain things you have to understand. You know, you have to to. To get, I mean, not everybody does a patch map. F-16s didn't do a patch map. Um, you might not do a designator turn the way we do. Uh, the Mirage 2000Ds didn't do a designator turn. They overflew the target. 117s overfly the target. And the way you get to that is you exercise with guys. But the way you do a smart plan is you ask guys what they think about what they ought to be doing and how they think they fit into the package and you work around them. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the French by 1999 had really come a long way. And so at the by that time, they were in my top tier of capable air forces. You know, I could ask the French to accomplish a task and not give them a second thought. I didn't have to watch over them. Um, they were going to do it. And, you know, I, I understood which tasks they would accept and which tasks they couldn't accept. 
but the mission commanders in Allied force were always Canadians, Royal Air Force, or Americans. The French could have done it, but they either lacked the confidence or their national restrictions wouldn't allow them to do it. So there were no French-led packages except possibly all French packages off the carrier in the Adriatic. Uh, and I flew one sortie with uh, support from those guys um, and the recce birds, actually, uh, off the aircraft. So, yeah, mission planning, just let the guys do their thing, work it all together. It's not your job to be their nanny. It's your job to put a strike baggage together and make some stuff blow up. This is obviously the uh, 1998 timescale, and then um, Allied Force went through uh, March 1999. Now, I'm going to be careful here and, and say up front, I'm doing this from memory, and I am standing ready to be corrected either by you or, or in the comments. But I, there was a 117 that was shot down, and you, we talked about this before, and you gave your analysis. You talked about the Mia scattering, Maya scattering. I can't remember exactly how you pronounce it, but... You know, I can I. That's... <laughs> That scattering effect, and you gave an explanation as to how it works. But one of the accusations that was leveled, and I don't know if it were ever proven, was that uh, certain fr sort of components within the French um, sort of leadership, at, or whether it's political or military, I'm not sure, have been providing information about um, flight paths and flight plans and timings and, and that kind of stuff. Did, did you have any um what i mean have you heard about that before and, and if you have what, what's your reaction to it and again we're we off on a tangent about it but... at the time um my reaction to it is all f-117 sorties run the u.s only ato that the french had no access to so um you can't blame any potential french leak uh the idea that there would be serbian simple uh, sympathizers in the French military with access to an air tasking order who would then leak that to the Serbs. That didn't sound credible to me then, and it doesn't sound credible to me now. And if we had known that much, I think there would have been prosecutions. And to my knowledge, there weren't. So I'm going to say that was all bullshit at the time. What I will tell you about an interesting data leak is about the automated European airport weather system. So at every duty desk, there was a little computer and they were, all, they were all linked together. And this is how you got the weather reports. You could put in any level four letter identifier and you could get the weather reports from any airfield in Europe. And the forecast for the next 24 hours, when hostilities kicked off, the Serbs did not cut themselves out of the weather system. So anytime we bombed an airfield, we went... And not only did we get our weather current at the time of brief, but we got their own forecast. We wrote that all down and we planned everything based on the weather forecast. And that went on for about a month before the Serbs finally realized. But by a month, we'd broken everything we were logically going to break um, at their airfields. But yes, we had a constant intelligence feed from stuff that was not turned off. Another question I wanted to ask you. Uh, which related to, I guess, sort of part two in your preparations for going to war, but again, is still relevant now, is what you thought about the former Republic of Yugoslavia's Air Force. So you talked about hitting that airfield in your previous clip compilation in part two. There was some MiG-21s and some MiG-29s. Interesting to know what you think about whether or not some of those might have been decoys. I know that they did a great job of of using decoys throughout the conflict. Uh, that was one did of they? the... That's what I've been told. They were pretty good at that's, creating. That's what I've read too, and I don't believe it. But go you don't on. Believe it. Okay, well, let's get your thoughts on that then. But um, but but what, uh, you know, what did you think about them? Were 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 they a credible threat? Did you look at them not necessarily as a peer threat because clearly they weren't that? But did you look at them as some something that could cobble together a four ship and do some damage if they were allowed to? Um, what level of ass of assessment did you have around them? I did not regard their air force as an uh, as a organization capable of doing anything other than sucking up AM ramps. Um, so we were self escorting. We were escorted by Dutch F sixteen AMs. We were escorted by our own C models. And I kind of viewed the air force, the flying part, as guys that were just going to get swarmed on. I mean, we had an entire squadron, an augmented squadron of guys out of uh Cherbia. um our own you know grim reapers and they were 
very good and they got some kills and the Dutch guys were very good and they got a kill. And so I just, they were outnumbered by our potential air to air assets. And I just felt it was going to be a food fight. And I could only hope that an errant MIG would come across my path or in the case of the ground attack guys, when we were flying the fire on cap an errant super, super Galeb. But that's, that's what I expected air defense. I'd been on the European Sam tactics analysis team before during and after the event. So I've been studying the air defense guys for years, and I expected them to be much more credible than the Iraqis were. Um, and I expected them to do what they did, which was as hostilities got close, they went into a mobility doctrine and they just flushed out into the countryside. And they were essentially impossible to track um, because they didn't go. You know, we had analyzed where they had gone for exercises and they didn't go to any of those places. So I was much more worried about the surface-to-air threat, which I think was still credible up to the last day of the war. Um, but we really had an overwhelming advantage, uh, and we threw a bunch of harms and alarms, for that matter. And it was a very challenging air defense environment. But to put that around, there were as many SAMs shot on the last day as the first night in terms of engagements. They didn't run out. They didn't stop being a threat. And I remember watching some guys last day tapes where they learned the important lesson, which is never make a third pass on a defended target. Um, and that was lucky that there weren't more uh, Sam kills. The other thing that was neat, um, why you want to have B1s in your package. So I, I said earlier, you know, I'd mentioned the B1. Yeah, I mentioned we had B1s flying and the B-52s were doing standoff, but the B1s were going in. And we could talk about precision delivery on an airfield and hitting taxiway runway intersections. And, you know, maybe we'll close the airfield for 24 hours. Two B1s go across carrying 80 Mark 82s each, and they go across a runway diagonally to make a cut. And that's it. It's not like there's a runway break. It's now you have to rebuild the runway from scratch. And furthermore, just to add insult to injury, they completely ruin the airfield as a radar navigation mark because they obliterate all those little nice objects. So I'm not sure um, there was an airfield uh, up against the West on, on Montenegro that I used to use as a radar designation you know, point to update my nav systems. And I'm going across Montenegro and nothing. B1s went across it and then it's gone. But the other thing the B1 had is they had the towed decoy. Mm -hmm. So they were stringing this little towed decoy about the back, which was supposed to suck up missiles of a certain type. But what you did know about B1s is that if there was a B1 in your strike package, no Serbian anti-aircraft gunner worth his salt was aiming at a fighter. He was going for one of the big boys. So you want to have a B-1 in your package because they're just going to suck off all the anti-aircraft fire. And you didn't feel bad about that because they had the decoy and you didn't. <laughs> so, yeah, got to have B-1s in your package. I loved having them. But, boy, just an impressive delivery capability uh, when it came to just sheer mass of unguided weapons. I mean, I say career-wise, I've dropped 100,000 pounds of bombs, most of them laser-guided, most of them in combat. B-1 guys, they'll do that on two sorties. <laughs> So, you know, I it sounds fairly heroic to me, but, you know, by their standards, they're just kind of brushing me off. Yeah, lightweight. To talk, talk uh, there's so many things that I want to ask you about that now, but to, to just go back to talking about your view on decoys then. Uh, my reading, and I won't, I won't be able to tell you where I read it because I don't remember. That's my standard answer. Um, was that they had been pretty inventive around decoys. They had some MiG-29 decoys. When you were showing the video earlier, I didn't, I haven't had time to go back and, and look at it again, but I thought some of them looked a bit, well, I don't know whether or not, there was a MiG-21 that looked like it might not have been real, I don't know. I'm guessing that if you, if, if it weren't real, you wouldn't have included it in your Greatest Hits compilation. But but what, what, what did you think then? I didn't think that they used decoys worth a damn. Um, and... I've seen it written in several places that there was effective use in decoys. And it's like, okay, well, you said that, but show me ordinance that was sucked into a decoy. Um, you know, the, the, the Serbs will claim that one of those MiG-29s that hit an AGM-130 was a decoy. And if so, it was a ridiculously high fidelity decoy. I mean, who builds a decoy with the IRST bubble forward of the cockpit? And the answer is nobody. 
Yeah. Um, some of the MiG-21s do look fuzzy. When you look at them again, you'll realize they're covered in camouflage netting. And as the AGM-130 gets close, you can actually see the leaves on the camouflage netting. So camouflaging your, this giant tactical bush on the taxiway, that's not fooling anybody either. Um, so what they did do effectively is they did a very effective shell game. So, for example, if you look at an SA-6 battery, a nominal SA-6 battery consists of one straight flush, which is uh, SA-6 radar, and it's an acquisition target tracker and illuminator all in one shot. Three or four TELs, transporter erector launchers, which have three missiles. Those are the three fingers of death. Um, possibly a command vehicle, depending on how they're going to do some interface, probably a radio vehicle, some maintenance and reloads. But one of the things that Serbs would do in the field is their batteries were short and they would only have two TELRs with the radar or two TELs with the radar, two missile launchers, because the other two TELs were fully loaded at their next location. So as SA-6 would shoot two missiles, as soon as that engagement was over, win or lose, and in most cases it was lose because the SA-6 got no kills, they're not going to hang around and shoot off all six of the missiles they start with. They're rolling. And the radar is going in one direction to join up with its next two tells, and the tells are going in another direction to get a reload, and then they're going to move to the next spot. So they were very good with their mobility doctrine. They were very good with playing a shell game. But honestly, I've heard the decoys before, and I remember seeing one video of a subscale SA-9 made out of milk cartons and painted green. And you see that if you look up SA-9 decoy Serbia, you'll see a picture of this. It's, you know, it's out there and people will say, well, they had great decoys. It's like, no, they didn't have a great decoy because if it was a great decoy, we'd hit it. So... Um, that's where it gets hard to prove is if it was a good decoy, we turned it into powder. Um, but I don't think that there was, I, I think it was, there was a shell game issue, but it's not the same as good decoys, particularly given the kind of targets we were hitting. Hmm. Um, you know, except for air defenses, where would you get? I mean, I watched, I've got film and it's part of the, I, I showed it, um, under, on the radar love video where you have an F-16 come in and he identifies an SA-6 tell and he hits the tell. And it's not a decoy, it's a real tell because the missile cooks off like a bottle rocket, which is my favorite. I mean, missile cook-offs, I love watching Ukrainians getting Russian missiles to cook off because that's just special. Um, did you see the video of the S-300 that launches and comes back? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, I watched that one several times because um, I kind of feel sympathetic uh, why you don't, why being next to, next to an air defense battery isn't the nicest, uh, thing. I also watched the one of the, I think it's an SA-15, no, it's an SA-19, a Tunguska, that, uh, the missile launches and immediately fails and hits a stack of buildings. Yeah, yeah. so, um, Russian surface-to-air missiles gave you plenty of opportunity, uh, for some unkind laughter. Thanks for tuning in to 10 Century. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.